Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar on CDC guidelines explained for housekeeping. I am Ralph Peterson, and I'm very excited to be here with everyone. This is going to be a very fast, very informative. About, we're going to take about 40, 45 minutes to go over not only what the CDC says regarding housekeeping and long-term care, but also some of the things that the way that we look at how to interpret the CDC guidelines here at the Standard Health and Rehab. If you are unfamiliar, if you are unfamiliar with the Standard Health and Rehab, we are an online, well, we're both in person and online, but we have an online training site for nursing home administrators and nursing home housekeeping managers. The thing that we do is we teach people, nursing home administrators and housekeeping managers, how to effectively and efficiently run housekeeping and laundry departments within long-term care. Our specialty is teaching people how to do it. I've been working in long-term care in housekeeping, laundry, and floor care for about 20 years. I've been doing it for an awful long time. And all along the way, I've learned all kinds of neat little tips and tricks. And one thing that I've learned more than anything else is that you have to be paying attention constantly to the CDC, especially when we have an outbreak. This is not the first outbreak that we've gone through in the long-term care arena. We've gone through SARS, we've gone through AIDS, HIV, we've gone through all kinds of, every year we go through the flu pandemic. The flu is always the biggest challenge for us. And in fact, if you're wondering what it is that you should be doing for this, for the for the COVID pandemic right now in long-term care, as far as cleaning goes, it is very similar, very similar to how we treat cleaning when we have a flu outbreak, when we have a GI outbreak, anything like that. Anytime you're going into a precaution room, if you think about going into and cleaning a precaution room, you are gowned up, you have gloves on, depending on the precaution, you might have a face shield on, a mask on, and you go into the resident room, you clean everything. And then as you come out of the resident room, everything that you brought in, every tool that you brought in, we're talking about mops and brooms and dustpans, all, all of that comes out with you and it gets wiped down as it comes out. Nothing leaves a precaution room without it being cleaned itself. All tools need to be cleaned coming out. Laundry is double bagged. The entire process of cleaning a precaution room is how we have been addressing how to clean the entire facility during the coronavirus. The biggest difference, of course, is PPE that everybody has to wear throughout the facility the entire time. Let me see if I can advance my little slide. Oh, I'm not even sharing my slides yet. Oh, Evag, hold on a minute. Let me, I'm way above, way ahead, way behind. Where am I? Let me see, there we go. All right, now you're seeing my slides, yay. <laughs> so now you're seeing my slides, good. So again, this is, uh, we're just doing the CDC guidelines explained for housekeeping. And then I was telling you about the standard health and rehab, which is a video based online program where we walk you through step-by-step -step how to create job routines, how to break down facilities, how to, how many housekeepers does it take to clean the resident rooms? How many resident rooms can a housekeeper clean? What about floor care? How often should you be doing floor care? How often should you be buffing floors, stripping and waxing floors, carpet care, sweeping and mopping, touching high surface areas? What are high surface areas? All of those things are what we go over in the Standard Health and Rehab on our online platform site. Plus we have a weekly call. Then we have individual calls with facility administrators and, and housekeeping directors to talk specifically about their facility. It's really a great thing, but let's get into what the CDC says is the most important for us to be doing during this time, the pandemic. First, I want to let you know that this webinar is based off of the CDC COVID-19 cleaning and disinfecting your facility publication that was updated on January 5th, 2021. <coughs> Make sure if you're watching this video series on a later date, that you go to the CDC website. We're gonna put the link in the, in the chat box. We will make sure you go to that site and make sure you are indeed looking at the latest update from the CDC. They do change their mind 
quite often. They do come up with new regulations quite often. And in housekeeping and in nursing, those in, in administrators, we always have to be looking at the CDC website to make sure we don't get all that many notifications. A lot of times I'm having to go to their website to find out that they've, they've made a change. And sometimes they just email you like, hey, there's a change. So make sure that you're, you're both signed up for their alerts as well as that you are being proactive and looking yourself because it's super important. So what does the CDC say? The CDC says, and this is with all state surveyors, this is with CMS, Department of, of, of um, Health and Human Services, everybody, the Department of Health, everybody says the same thing when it comes to housekeeping. Housekeeping is a three-part series that everybody's expected to have this in place. A plan, you, you develop your plan, you implement your plan, and then you maintain and or revise your plan as you go forward. As you go forward, you maintain and revise your plan as needed. This is, in essence, how we get out of trouble with the CDC, with the state surveyors, because if you have a plan, if you have implemented your plan, and if you have a process for going through and following up and revising that plan, I'm telling you, even if you miss things, even if you get something wrong today, having a plan will ensure that you get it tomorrow. And that's really what the CDC is saying. The CDC says you need to have these three elements. And so I am a, I do an awful lot of management training. And this, in a nutshell, I just tried to give you a visual representation. When I'm teaching people how to manage, especially brand new managers, first time managers, because a lot of managers, a lot of new managers, a lot of people believe that managing is all about reading people, knowing how to talk to people, knowing how to diffuse problems, knowing how to solve problems. All that stuff is really great, probably even necessary. I say probably because it is nothing. It is completely buckets. It doesn't mean that anything if you do not already have a system to manage. A system is the most important part of a management process. You have to have something you're managing too. And this is called a leadership system. I'm going to show you what it looks like with the CDC guidelines. But essentially, a leadership system is made up of three components. You have a decision, you're communicating that decision, and you're following up to make sure that decision is done. When I do, when you go through the standard, you'll see we do this in housekeeping. Our decision is to change a, make a room change. Resident A is going to go to resident room B. So the decision is made, what we're doing. Then we take and we communicate that to who we communicate it to the housekeeper, we communicate it to maintenance, we communicate it to nursing, everybody that's gonna be involved in that room change. And then you follow up to make sure the room change was done. It's that simple. That's a leadership system. And we go through under the standard, if you were to, to go on the standard.com, the standard help and rehab.com, you'll see we do this for every different scenario admissions, discharges, and expirations, change of schedule, complete rooms, stripping and waxing projects, you name it, wheelchair cleaning, you name it, we can just put anything in there. Decision what we're going to do, how we're going to communicate it, how we're going to follow up, and it's this continual cycle. And that is how we clean and make decisions in nursing homes, in housekeeping, really could do it in any department. Now, this is the CDC. So it's the same system. CDC says, develop your plan, implement your plan, maintain and revise your plan. And so it's always going in this circle. What it means is that developing your plan is not stationary. It means you don't develop a plan one time and you never have to make a correction. You never have to do anything to it. One and done and you're fine. That's not the CDC guidelines. It's not good management practice. The best thing to do is develop a plan implement the plan, communicate with everybody who needs to know what, what the plan is, then you, as you, after you implement the plan, you start maintaining, you start looking at the plan. Is it working? Do adjustments have to be made? And as adjustments have to be made, all of a sudden you can update and develop your plan even further. That is the point of a leadership system. That is the point of the CDC guidelines, which are pretty straightforward. I'm going to give you kind of an overview of how we take our leadership system and we bring it down. So I'm going to show you kind of an overview of how our process works. So this is 
traditional housekeeping. And again, this is all based on the CDC guidelines, which is develop a plan, implement your plan, and then communicate, follow up with your plan. So this is it. So we, the when traditional housekeeping at the standard anyway, this is how we do it. Our housekeepers start with presentation in mind. That is, they are looking at how everything is done in or how everything looks in the nursing home first thing in the morning it's all presentation based so all our housekeepers are going into resident rooms and pulling trash and making sure the supplies are there and there's nothing on the floor and there's no bad orders it's just presentation then after they do that the entire building the first thing they do is they look at the entire building then they start cleaning and disinfecting rooms then at some point in the morning depending on where your what your nursing home schedule is because you have to work with nursing in order to get all these schedules right. I wish we worked in housekeeping homes, but of course we don't, we work in nursing homes. And so we have to pay attention to what nurses are doing to try to find out the best practices on how we can get in between them without causing too much of a riff. And so we do a complete clean every day, five days a week. We don't do complete cleans on weekends, not of resident rooms anyway. And that's because of two reasons. One is because it is the worst time for residents because a lot of times, especially pre-COVID, not so much now when there's no visitors, but pre-COVID, there was an awful lot of visitors that would come in on weekends, family visitors. And it's just a little bit too much work to try to pull rooms apart and make residents get out of their room for 45 minutes to an hour every day on weekends. And so we, we don't do it for that reason. But I'll tell you the biggest reason why we don't do complete resident rooms, like a deep clean on resident rooms during the weekend is because it requires nursing help. Nursing does have to be involved with our complete room and nursing is usually short staffed or running at a deficit on weekends. And because of that, we are mindful of that. And we don't want to try, we don't want to add more work to their load either. And so we manage it five days a week. So we do a complete clean before lunch. And then after lunch, we continue with our cleaning and disinfectant. We are not able to get all of our rooms done in the morning. We need a full day. So we do half in the morning, half in the afternoon. And then before the housekeepers leave, they do the same drive-by kind of walkthrough that they started with in the morning. They do it right again at night. And it's called presentation, making sure everything looks good and that there's no odors. And that is how we traditionally have run housekeeping prior to the coronavirus. Now, with the coronavirus, the CDC guidelines say that extra care should be taken to ensure that all high touch point areas are cleaned and disinfected regularly. They do not give a number of times a day. It doesn't say three times a day, five times a day, eight times a day. It says as necessary, regularly as necessary. And so what does it mean as necessary? And by the way, the CDC, the state, everybody, they're super vague and they're super vague on things like this for a reason. The reason is because the reason they leave it up to interpretation is because every home is different. Every situation is different. And it is best to allow the home allow the housekeeping director, allow the administrator some flexibility, the director of nursing, some flexibility in what the interpretation is and how to interpret and implement what the CDC intent is. And by the way, that's all this is. CDC guidelines are their intent. They in, their intent is to help you ensure that your facility is cleaned and disinfected enough times a day. If that's one time a day is enough, good. If 10 times a day is enough, good. The CDC doesn't care. The only thing the CDC cares about is the end result. The end result is a clean and disinfected facility. One of the biggest examples of this where the CDC gives broad guidelines and nothing specific is about housekeeping carts. I ask this question all the time when I'm doing seminars because it's a fun little gotcha question. I always ask everybody in the audience, how far can you have a housekeeping cart to a resident food cart? So, you know, food comes in food carts or in the dining room. How close or how far away does the housekeeping cart have to be from the food cart or the dining room? And you wouldn't believe how many people know the answer. 
They raise their hand and they're like six feet, eight feet, 10 feet, 20 feet. I heard it has to be locked up in a closet. The CDC says nothing about it. The CDC says that your housekeeping cart, dirty material, cleaning chemicals should be far enough away from the resident eating food so that it does not impact the resident. Well, what does impact the resident mean? See, it's left up to our interpretation. Obviously, you would say odor is a big problem with cleaning, with housekeeping carts. Odor could be because it's dirty. Odor could be because you have chemicals that are very strong. If you're the type of facility that uses a lot of bleach, you certainly don't want to have bleach, the odor of bleach in a dining room or near somebody eating their breakfast or their lunch, obviously. And so that's the type of thing that we're talking about. The CDC doesn't say you have to maintain six feet difference distance because six feet might not be enough if you have bleach on the cart. And then 20 feet different distance may not even be possible. I've worked in a lot of nursing homes where there isn't 20 feet between one hall and the other hall. You couldn't, unless you put the housekeeping cart outside, you wouldn't be able to have it even in the building. And so the CDC is very clear with their vagueness. All they want to do is they want to have their intent out there. And so that's the whole point about the intent. And so with the CDC, with the coronavirus, this is our antivirus housekeeping, we made a couple of changes, not just to the format, but not just the way it looks, but actually to the format. I'm going to just go through this one more time. It's presentation, then we start disinfecting, we do a complete room, we finish disinfecting, and then presentation. The way we do it with the coronavirus is instead of the presentation beginning our day and ending our day, you're going to see we no longer have presentation involved. We're no longer going in every resident room at the start of the day and going in every resident room at the end of the day. Instead, we've exchanged those two ideas, those two practices for disinfecting all high area touch points at the beginning of the day. And then we do our cleaning of resident rooms. Then we still do our complete clean. We finish disinfecting our resident rooms. And then we do our high touch point disinfecting again, which is different. We weren't doing that with, when there's no coronavirus, we don't do that. We are, if you look at the little box on the right hand, bottom right hand side, when it's traditional housekeeping, housekeepers in a resident room following our plan at the standard health and rehab three times a day. When the coronavirus, they were in a resident room only one time a day. And the reason for that is because we have to disseminate what a high touch point area is compared to a low touch point area. So first, let me show you what the standard health and rehab looks like. This is our facility map at the standard health and rehab. It's a hundred bed building. So there are 50 rooms, they're all semi-private, West Hall, East Hall, Short Hall. Our Short Hall is our rehab area. So that's where rehab is. And what we had to do is we had to go through and identify every room, every area, public bathrooms, nurses station, clean utilities, soil utilities, shower rooms, all the offices, the conference room, the admin office, the, the employee break room, the barber shop, you name it. We, named, we went through, we labeled every single room in their entire facility. And then we made a list. And the list was to compare high touch points versus low touch points. And we wanted to know where is the most traffic compared to where is the least amount of traffic. And this is what we found. When we're talking about high traffic areas, we're looking at doorknobs, handrails, telephones, public bathrooms, elevators, the reception area, the nurses station, the public entrance, the employee break room, the public bathrooms, but look at what's on the other side of low touch points. It's super interesting. And I, I'm sure that I get a lot of pushback when I first bring it up, but trust me when I say office space, most office space and resident rooms are low touch points. In other words, there are very few people who go into a resident room. The two people who live in the resident room go there and maybe a housekeeper goes in once a day, the nurse, nurse, nursing aides, they go in and out of there maybe a few times a day, but the amount of people that go in and out of a resident room 
is very little compared to how many people go to the reception in the front desk. Everybody. So most 100 bed nursing home, we have about 150 staff members, 150 staff members. How many of those 150 staff members go through the front door? Every single one of them. How many of those 150 staff members go to every resident room? Zero, right? Like every, none of them go to every resident room. And so a high traffic area is not a resident room. The only areas where I would say in offices, the only offices that I would say is a high traffic area is usually staff development. Staff development is usually a very, everybody goes to staff development, usually to complain, but everybody goes to staff development. So staff development is one of those offices. We also, our conference room is usually a high traffic area because we must have, we might have conference or, or meetings in there a few times a day. Sometimes administrator's office, sometimes a nursing, the DON office. Generally speaking, business offices, MDS, medical records, all of those, they do not get a lot of high traffic. As a matter of fact, there's usually only one or two people in those offices always. And so they are not high traffic areas. And if you look at a map I went through, I highlighted I highlighted our, our facility map here at the Standard Health and Rehab. <coughs> this is actually, I went through and I labeled it as well. So I was kind of just labeling where everything is because it's the facility map doesn't come pre-labeled and we're known for moving offices all the time. So nothing ever stays the same. But everything that I highlighted in pink, kind of looks purple here. Everything I highlighted in pink or purple here is a high traffic area. So if you look at the amount of white space, it's humongous compared to the amount of pink space. That is always going to be the case when we're talking about a high traffic area to a low traffic area. The high traffic areas here are the clean and soil utility room. Actually, I will say that the clean and soil utility room are not typically high traffic areas, but because of what goes in and out of, high, of those areas, we do have to consider them high traffic areas. Soil utility rooms need to be cleaned or wiped down constantly. Shower rooms, therapy, dining rooms, reception, public bathrooms, the employee break room, both nurses station are high traffic areas and clean and soil utility rooms, that's it. Yeah, that's it. All the office spaces are not high traffic. None of the resident rooms are high traffic. And you might also notice too that I, I you, you can't really see it, but I did highlight the hallways. I kind of highlighted the up and down in the hallways. That's because we have a lot of handrails and a lot of our residents pull themselves using the handrail with their wheelchair. They're in their wheelchair and they're pulling themselves down the hall. And so handrails, elevator buttons, we only have the standard health and rehab is only one floor. We have a basement, but it's we have an elevator that only goes down one floor. So not a lot of people use the elevator, but in traditional buildings where you have multiple floors, elevators, elevator buttons, telephones, doorknobs, handrails, all those are high traffic areas. And again, this is no different than if it was a flu breakout. If you had a GI outbreak, it would be no different. We would, this would be the same thing. The only difference, of course, with the coronavirus is two differences. One is the what the PPE that the person has to be wearing while cleaning and inside a nursing home now. And two, the chemical that we're using or the attempted chemical that we are, are using. And I'm going to get into what chemicals you should be using more suggestions and what the CDC says about chemical use that kills C. diff. We're going to get into that whole thing. So now again, if you remember, the CDC says that you have to make a plan, you have to implement your plan, and then you have to follow up on your plan. And so just to bring this down a little further to show you what we do at the Standard Health and Rehab is this is our, this is a housekeeping job routine for one of our housekeepers. This is West Hall Housekeeper. And as you can see, well, if, let me show you to point out a couple of things. Number one, we are big fans of putting the policy on the jobs description because this is not our full policy, it's just a snapshot policy, but it's important because we use these job routines as training for our staff as well. So we like to have the policy there, but then we time it. 
7, 7 30, 8 45, 9 o'clock, 9 15. We time what we want everybody to be doing, when they'll be doing it, and where they're going. The next thing we do is every housekeeper every day gets a housekeeping checklist, a daily housekeeping checklist. And this literally has the, the housekeeper check off every area that they've went in through and clean. And the reason that is important is because we need to be able to prove the CDC comes in and does a and does an infection control survey, which they do all the time, where the state comes in and does an infection control survey, which they do all the time, they are going to want to see how you are ensuring that all areas of your facility are being cleaned every day. And so what we did is we implemented this daily schedule, housekeeping daily schedule, where we ask our housekeepers to sign off, just to put a little check and at the bottom of the form, I'm not sure you don't see the full form here because it's just a snapshot, but the full form has in the bottom line, it has a signature. I'm going to give you a little bit of a warning though, from the idea, from the, from the perspective of managing this, you have to understand, go in knowing that housekeepers don't have the ability to clean every single room and get to every nook and cranny and every single thing every single day. It's simply not going to happen. There are far too many things. Room changes come up, staff shortages happen, pipes break, toilets overflow, equipment breaks down, we run out of supplies. All of those things happen and it makes it so it's in, it's very difficult for a housekeeper to get in every single room three times a day, twice a day, so you have to be knowing that when you're going to implement something like this, you have to, you have to be very transparent with your team and let them know that they're not going to be in trouble for missing stuff or not being able to get into stuff. Because if you say, hey, listen, you everything on this list better be marked off or you're going to be in trouble, then all your housekeeper is going to do is one of two things. They're going to either pencil whip it, which means they're going to check everything off whether they did it or not or they're going to forget to sign it. They're going to be like, oh, I forgot to sign it. Oh, I forgot to sign it. Neither one of those things are good for us. Neither one of those things are good for us. And so what I do, I have my, oh, it's taken a little bit of time, but I built complete trust with my housekeeping staff, me with them, them with me. And not everybody, listen, not everybody's honest. And I get that. Not everybody is, is on the up and up. Not everybody works hard. I get that. I'm, okay, what am I going to do? I have a housekeeper who comes to me at the end of the day and there are five resident rooms that they did not get done. I would much rather them tell me that those leave those five rooms unchecked because tomorrow morning I'm going to say, hey, let's start with these five rooms that we missed yesterday. So let's start here first and then move on. Because what happens if, if I don't have that, if I don't have that kind of trust and that kind of relationship with my staff, they won't tell me what rooms they didn't get to. I won't know. I won't know to tell them to start there. I won't be able to help and assist them. And it won't take long before the state walks in, the resident's given an interview, and the resident says, the housekeeper's never in my room. <laughs> and as much as we want to say, oh, that's not true, that resident doesn't know what they're talking about, the housekeeper goes in there, all it takes is one person with a couple of, a couple of eyeballs to walk in, look under a bed, pull up a mattress, look behind a curtain, and you can see, hey, it doesn't look like anybody's been here in here for a couple of weeks. And you're like, oh, well, I should have, I should have had some way of knowing because listen, housekeeping managers, we can't be in every room. We can't see every room every single day. It's not possible. And because it's not possible, it's important to understand that you have to, you have to give your staff some tools so they can get the job done themselves. And then you have to give them some trust extend some trust and help them proactively solve any issues that come up day to day to day. Not everything is going to happen today. Between today and tomorrow, I get it all done. That's signed with me. It's totally fine with me. It's the way we manage it. And finally, we also have an inspection form. So in addition to, we have a clear job routine. That's our, that's our policy is we implemented our plan. And then we, we created our plan. I'm sorry. We created our plan. We implemented it. We have this daily, daily little implementation tool showing you what to do, when to do it. And then we follow up with an inspection form. And this inspection form is completed by the housekeeping manager and is completed on every resident room 
during uh, during the week, Monday through Friday, every resident area, we do an inspection on that room to make sure it is clean and disinfected appropriately every single day. And that, my friends, is one, two, three. That is following the CDC guidelines completely. Let me make sure if I have any questions at all. Let me see here. Okay. All right. Anybody have any questions at all? Okay, good. So now the big, now the big question is what chemical should we be using? And for that, we'll go to the CDC guidelines. This is so interesting to me because one of the, one of the, I'm going to stop my screen share for a minute. Let me get out of here and make you make you look at me instead of the screen. Ah, that's better. Huh. So the big question is when it comes to cleaning and disinfecting, what chemical should you use and how long should you have your con how what contact time should you be following? And if you look at any chemical nowadays, anything that says it has the ability to clean and disinfect for coronavirus, every single one of the bottles will tell you that the contact time, that is the amount of time that the chemical has to stay wet on the, on the physical surface is 10 minutes. Let me ask you a question. Does 10 minutes seem like a long time to you? Seems like a long time to me. But why do you think every chemical company, everyone, it doesn't matter what company you look at whether it's 3M or Green X or Simplex, whatever. They all say the same thing. 10 minute contact time. Why not 11? Why not 12? Why not nine? Why does every one of them say 10 minutes? Isn't that, is that to say that all chemicals have the same efficacy? The answer is no, can't be. So why is it 10 minutes? I'm going to tell you why. The reason it is 10 minutes is because 10 minutes is the maximum amount of time that the federal government, the FDA, gives a cleaning company. They say you have to kill a virus within 10 minutes. It can't go beyond 10 minutes. Beyond 10 minutes, a chemical can't pass through the FDA. So the government sets the 10 minute maximum. And so what is a chemical company to do when there's a new disease out there and they're not sure what's going to happen and there may be this potential lawsuit and all that. I mean, you could just imagine how easy it would be to try to get people to try to sue a chemical company if you're having an outbreak of COVID. And you're like, well, maybe our chemicals aren't working. The chemical company come back and say, did you have it wet for 10 minutes? And you're going to say, um, no, how in how how is it possible to maintain ten minutes? Of, could you imagine the largest flat surface in a facility? The largest flat surface is the floor. Now, I've been working in housekeeping for twenty years, and I'm going to tell you the number one thing when it comes to floor care. The number one thing is safety, and safety comes wet floors. We do not want wet floors. We don't want wet floors for a minute. We want them dry as soon as possible. When we sweep a mop a floor, when we're mopping a floor, we wring out the water so it's bone, that mop is bone dry. We want very little water on that floor because too many people slip and fall. So the idea that you have to maintain a floor being wet for 10 minutes or a bedside table, or a mattress, or a windowsill, or a remote control. That's right. I saw the other day, I saw somebody with a washcloth, and they were just kept wringing out the washcloth over the remote control. And I said, why are you ruining the remote control? They said, the guidelines say you have to keep it wet for 10 minutes, and our residents are always touching a remote control, and so we want to make sure that they don't get the coronavirus. You know, they're not going to get the coronavirus. What they're going to get from that, from you doing that, they're going to get laryngitis because they're going to be screaming from their top of their lungs and yelling at you because their remote's not going to be working and they can't watch the show they're trying to get on. They can't turn up the TV. They can't turn it down. They can't turn it on because you soaked it in water for 10 minutes. It's, I think one of my favorite, I know I'll go on tangents. 
I think one of my favorite, one of my favorite topics is I have a friend who works in homicide and I asked him how many murder, how many people, well, first he told me, I didn't ask him this. I was just asking him about contact time with blood and how many, how criminals clean up. But he said that seven out of 10 murders go unsolved. Seven out of 10. Think about that. That's a huge number. Maybe that's only regional to him. I don't know if that's a national number or just regional to him, but he said seven out of 10. And most of those murders require an awful lot of they're messy crime scenes, meaning there's blood and everything else everywhere. He said, but criminals do a really good job. The reason they go unsolved is because criminals do a really good job cleaning up after themselves. And so I was excited to learn that. I'm like, okay, what does the cleaning, what does the, the, the criminal use to clean up after themselves? And you would not believe what it was. I thought I thought it was going to be bleach. I thought that, you know, everybody goes to the laundry room and gets bleach. And the, my friend Billy said, not everybody has bleach in a, in a resident home. Not everybody uses bleach, especially when you have now everybody has those little pods with the, like the Tide pods or whatever to clean laundry. Not a lot of people have bleach, certainly not in a bottle, certainly not stored everywhere. He said, but everybody has da, 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 dish soap. Criminals, seven out of 10 criminals get away with it. And about half of those, let's say three of those anyway, three out of the 10 three out of the seven clean up after themselves with dish soap. And every house in America has dish soap. It's either on the sink, next to the sink or under the sink. You can find dish soap in every household in America. And this is the number one thing that criminals use to clean up after themselves. And what are they cleaning? DNA. They're cleaning blood, they're cleaning spores, they're cleaning, they're making sure that you can't find them. There's no visible, visible or uh, physical trace of them. And, you know, in nursing homes, we're like, oh, well, it has to be uh, this acidic chemical. It has to be soap and water, friends, because let me tell you this. Here, I have my little double tail here. Let me, show you, let me show you this. Let me show you this and this. I don't have a paper towel. I have a napkin. I have a tissue. I have a cotton rag and I have a microfiber. And the question is, which one of these, a tissue, paper tissue, a cotton rag, or a microfiber, which one of these cleans the surface better? Which one gets rid of the coronavirus better or blood better? The answer is, they all work the same. They all do the same thing. A napkin will work just as good as a microfiber rag. Now, the CDC says that if they give you a recommendation between what to use as a cleaning cough, they say microfiber. The reason they say microfiber, and you can read it for yourself in the literature, the reason they say microfiber is because it is the because of the, the tightly wound stitching in microfiber makes it so that it traps virus and debris and and, and dust and mites and all that, it traps it better than a cotton rag, certainly better than a paper rag. However, that is talking about a dry, dry microfiber rag. And a, it's compared to a dry cotton rag and a dry tissue rag. When we are cleaning in nursing homes, we do not use a spray bottle. This spray bottle, mine just says disinfectant. This spray bottle is not, this is not how we clean. We use a double pail. A double pail is like this. It looks just like this, has two sides to it. One side has clean rags dipped in germicide and the other side is for our dirty rags. We put a bag on the side for the dirty rags and we put in our rag, we wring it out full of germicide and then we swipe, scour, and disinfect. We clean the mechanical act of cleaning. The mechanical act of cleaning coupled with the disinfectant and the soap is how you clean a surface. It's how you disinfect a surface. You could do the same thing with this, as with this, as with this. When they are all wet, they all do the same thing. The reason we don't use paper is for a bunch of reasons. One, it's really not that strong. 
one, especially when it's wet, it doesn't stay well together. It's very hard to scrub. It's very little scrubbing power. And you can't keep it. You have to throw it away. It causes an awful lot of rubbish. And you don't need that. The reason that we use microfiber as opposed to cotton is because microfiber is said to trap it better, but it doesn't trap it better when it's wet. They trap basically the same. The problem with microfiber, however, is microfiber because it is made differently, because it has tighter stitching, because it is woven differently, it requires a different type of washing machine. That's right. This requires a different type of washing machine to clean microfiber. Microfiber doesn't get clean in a regular washer like that this does. And so unless you have a microfiber washing machine, that's really not that affordable either. And they're super expensive. Good old cotton rags are the way to go. Now, the way we do it at the standard is like I was saying, we use a cotton rag. We use two cotton rags per resident room, one for the resident room, one for the bathroom. And we keep, we put eight or 10 of them in one side. We put germicide in it with water, mix it, dilute it the way it's supposed to go. And then take one rag out at a time, wring it out, start at the door, clean all the workable surface areas, all the common areas, swipe, clean, wipe down. By the time you get to the end of the room, you put it on the dirty side of the double pail and you get a new one for the bathroom, put that in the dirty side, never re-dip your rags. Everything works out just fine. Now, the CDC says when it comes to, when it comes to, again, we're, we're just going through their disinfectant and their processes. They give you a list of chemicals and we'll put up the list here, a list of chemicals that they recommend for cleaning and disinfecting with the coronavirus. However, In addition to that list from the EPA, in addition to that list, they say, if you do not have access to, let me just make sure it's up, good. If you do not have access to the, a cleaning agent, a chemical from a manufacturer that has a claim that it can disinfect the coronavirus, it says that you can use, this is from the CDC, so I'm, it, you know what, these, this is just one of those ironical things I just think is so fun. If you do not have access to a chemical that has a kill rating on the coronavirus, it says that you can use a bleach and water solution. A bleach and water solution, which is a 10 to one or a five tablespoons of bleach, one third cup of bleach to four tablespoons of, I mean, uh, five tablespoons of water. It's basically two thirds water, one third bleach is the makeup. And your contact time for that is one minute. One minute. The CDC says bleach and water contact time to kill the coronavirus is one minute. If you go to 3M products, go to Green X products, Simplex products, they all say, oh, you need 10 minutes, you need 10 minutes. Bleach and water, according to CDC, says you need one minute. One minute. I think it's super great. It just goes to show you that you don't need 10 minutes of contact time. I'm not telling you not to put it on there for 10 minutes. I'm saying that I would leave it wet. I would use a rag full of germicide and I would just leave the surface wet. I would not sit there with my housekeepers to make sure that it stayed wet for 10 minutes. Two other quick things. One about laundry. In laundry for a long time, there was a there was a big move years ago, and I know some facilities still use it. They use the breakaway bags or they're yellow and they dissolve in warm water. And they're used for precaution clothes. So clothes comes out of a precaution room. You have, you have water, you have, um, you put them in these yellow bags. Laundry doesn't open the yellow bag. Instead, they throw the yellow bag right in the wash machine. The hot water dissolves the bag and then it never exposes the laundry aid to the linen. The problem or the challenge with those bags, especially over the last five or 10 years is the price of those bags just keep going up. Garbage bags are a, you know, they ebb and flow with the price of oil. And so they can be very expensive, very challenging. And 
not only that, but they're not always properly used. Sometimes people use them, sometimes people don't. And so there's this false positive, this false sense of, of security when a laundry aide see a, a clear bag as opposed to a yellow bag because they treat a clear bag differently. So that was the best practice. So what we started doing is we started double bagging all laundry that comes out of a precaution room, which means all the linen comes out, puts gets into a bag, and then we put it in another bag. The CDC recommends when during the coronavirus, and this again is pretty much true for all, if you have an outbreak, a GI outbreak, if you have the flu outbreak, something like that, they, do, they recommend that you do not shake out linen. Shaking out linen releases whatever microorganism into the air that could be on the linen, and could be give further exposure to the, re the laundry person in the laundry room. However, although they say not to do it, I'm going to tell you here at the standard, we have to do it. We don't have any choice. We have to separate, sort, and shake out all linen. And the reason is because we get an awful lot of stuff that comes down into our wash into our laundry that can't go in washing machines. Everything from cell phones and hearing aids to full diapers full of BM or bowel movement, crap. And we can't put that in our washers. And it, we have sometimes, we have a real bad problem with it. Sometimes we don't have any problem with it at all, but we don't have the luxury of going, you know what? We're just gonna throw it into the washing machine. We're not gonna shake anything out. We have to shake it out because it's a bad, bad thing. If we find something, you find a phone in the washing machine, it's already too late. And you know, you, how many phones do you have to wash before, before your administrator loses their mind? Go, could you please stop washing cell phones? It's $800 a piece. So it's important that we don't do that. So instead of doing that, what we do is we double bag. That gives our laundry the heads up. When you open a bag of laundry and there's another bag in there, that's a separate bag that's in a bag itself, the laundry aide knows to put it in the washing machine, then open the bag, that way it reduces their amount of exposure. But again, with the coronavirus, we are wearing face shields, we are wearing masks, we are wearing gowns and gloves. And so our laundry aids are pretty safe. They're being pretty safe. The other thing, the last thing I wanna talk about what the CDC says regarding how to clean nursing homes in during this coronavirus pandemic is they talk about the the rooms, how often, how long you should wait between a room, cleaning a room, or even going in a room after a resident who has tested positive with the coronavirus has left that room. Their ideal is 24 hours. They would like you to pull a resident out of a resident room if they get diagnosed with the coronavirus. Let's say they get diagnosed with the coronavirus and they go to the hospital. They would like you to shut that door and not let anybody in that room for 24 hours before you go in to clean it. That way it gives the air handlers in the room the chance to take all, recirculate all of that air. They also say that you should shut off things like wall units that are, you know, like wall unit, window unit, air conditioners and fans, anything to stop the air from moving. But you can't shut off the, the, HV, the HVAC system. So don't shut off the HVAC system. It says it clearly in these guidelines. Don't shut off the HVAC system system because that causes even more damage than, than leaving it on. And if you don't have 24 hours to wait, and I don't know about your home, but we never have 24 hours to wait unless your census is really low. Maybe you can, but we don't at the standard. We can't wait that long. And so we, we estimate that our air handlers can recycle the room, recycle the air in our facility, about every three hours. That's being quite conservative. So there are some people who think we, it only takes 90 minutes, two hours. I've heard our engineers say, you know, the whole building is recycled every two hours. You're like, oh, I have no idea. I don't know how long it takes. I know that we decided on three hours. And so if we can, not always possible, but if we can, we try to leave the room alone for three hours before we send a housekeeper in there or anybody in there to clean and disinfect the room after somebody has left that has been tested positive with the coronavirus. And that is in a nutshell, the 
interpretation, our interpretation of how to follow the CDC guidelines to clean your facility in long-term care. And again, it's very simple, three-step process, come up with a plan, implement that plan, and then follow up on that plan. If you have if you would like to learn more about how we do it at the standard, we do host a workshop, four workshops a year. This workshop, by the way, is in person. We are doing it in person in March in Long Island. So look for some information on that. And the, the workshop is three days and it's for administrators to learn how to create job routines, how to set up their housekeeping department, how to oversee it, how to do inspections, all about how to train their housekeeping manager. You are allowed to bring a plus one, which means you can take your housekeeping manager with you at no extra cost to the event. So that's always great with the, you're training the housekeeping manager as well. Three days, it's a nice workshop for the standard health and rehab. And then we have an annual program where if you would like to have constant access to our team and our resources, and we helping you all every week. We have calls every week. We have meetings. We have four times a year. If you belong to the Standard Health and Rehab, which is an annual program, if you belong to that, the workshops, the four times a year workshops are free. They're included with the price of the standard. So if you have a new housekeeping manager every couple of months, then this is the program for you because they can always come back and attend our workshop and be right on the same page as you are, your administrators, Administrators don't stay in buildings either. So this is building related. It's not individual. We don't sell the standard to individuals. It is only sold to nursing homes. So the nursing home owns the rights to it, which means if an administrator leaves, your other administrator just come right in. They can attend the workshop. They can have access to all the all our publications, all our videos, all our how-tos. Plus there's a, a weekly call with us. There's a monthly call with us, one-on-one -on -one call with us. So if you are interested in learning more about the Standard Health and Rehab and our workshops, go to the standardhealthandrehab.com and we'll also put all the links in the chat here. And if anybody has any questions at all, no, that's good. Thank you for watching and we will see you soon.